hello everyone and hello Gordon Lafer. Um, this is Lisa Graves with True North, Re True North Research and uh, for Bold Rethink. This is our Democracy Dialogue series and I am so excited today to have this conversation, this dialogue with Gordon um, uh, on behalf of Bold Rethink. Um, Gordon is, uh, I, I don't know how long I've known you for Gordon, it might be almost 10 years now um, so. around that with the anniversary of Alec Exposed. Um, but uh, Gordon and I also served together on the board of the Center for Media and Democracy, which I previously led. Uh, but, but Gordon does a whole lot more than that. Uh, he is a, a professor um, uh, in the Labor and Education Research Center at the University of Oregon, and he, he uh, has worked with the Economic Policies Institute. Um, he's uh, written an amazing book that we're going to talk about that I think everyone should read. Um, and, you know, just really is one of the finest analysts and uh, economists studying labor policy and the impact of the sort of right wing groups uh, like uh, the Koch groups that have really um, dominated American politics and harmed our economy. So um, thank you so much, Gordon. Welcome to uh, wel welcome to Democracy Dialogues. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me to be here. <laughs> uh, well, so on this uh, this week's edition of Dialogues for Democracy, I'm going to talk with you about your book, The One Percent Solution. Thanks for uh, someone posted that in the chat. The One Percent Solution: How Corporations Are Remaking America One State at a Time. I uh, I just thought the book was spot on. Just uh, you know, paragraph after paragraph of showing this. Um, your work really is right in line with what we are trying to do here at Bold Rethink where our mission is to expose, discredit, and dismantle the ra radical right-wing corporate agenda that has really undermined people's faith in our democracy and the power of government to be a force for good. Um, at the same time, we're working to try to rebuild trust in government through a progressive democracy that really assures the health and well-being of uh, people and our planet. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your work and about that book um, that exposes you know, what was happening uh, on these issues in the states at the time and what you've seen since then? Can you share that with us? I can. And of course, like the book draws heavily on your work with Alec Exposed. So uh, no surprise, it seems like a smart product. But uh, basically, I was um, I left, I was working in the US Congress and left in January, 2011. And starting in February, 2011, when Scott Walker in Wisconsin introduced the, the bill to do away with public sector unions in Wisconsin, we started seeing this rash of legislation across the country. There was a lot of anti-union stuff, but there was a lot of other things too, you know, blocking increases in the minimum wage, lowering wages in construction industry, privatizing libraries, making it harder to sue for race and sex discrimination. And in each place that this happened, people tended to perceive that, oh, this comes out of the mind of this particular state representative, state legislator, and it's in response to some particular problem in our state. And it started to seem too common, like we saw too much of the same things. And I was working with the Economic Policy Institute at the time and was asked to do some research on some of these and started thinking, all right, what is the connection between all these things that don't obviously have a connection? You know, like changes in construction law with blocking Medicaid expansion with privatization of libraries. You wouldn't, you didn't at the beginning think that they, um, that they all went together. And so I spent a long time, some testifying on some things, um, doing a lot of research on, with, on uh, American Legislative Exchange Council on ALEC um, and the Koch brothers and other corporate organizations and trying to figure out that all these things were basically coming from the same place and were part of a coherent agenda. And that's what the, my book tries to, track that and also make sense of what is the common agenda and why does it make sense for all these big corporations to, to back it? Yeah, I mean, it really is a tour de force. And as you point out, you know, um, it, it's not just one state and another state. One of the things I discovered when I uh, was looking at um, Alec back starting in 2011 for earnestly was, you know, people don't read other people's state newspapers. We can barely keep track of what's happening in our own state. And so, um, you know, you don't realize unless there are, 
um, books like yours or reporters who are writing about the national trends, how much of this is happening in state after state, regardless of the needs and desires of the people of that state. And here in Wisconsin, where I am, as you point out, we were at sort of ground zero of some of that effort. And many of the things you named, including blocking Medicaid expansion, the you know the the attacks on private sector labor as well as public sector labor, you know those were the longstanding agenda of Alec. Uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council and uh, the Coke funded ALEC, which Charles Koch and Koch Industries has been one of the longest uh, funders and lead corporate leaders of ALEC along with some other huge corporations. Um, but it's also the case that, uh, you know, we, we, we did not know, uh, and I was in Washington for, for quite a while, um, as, as were you in, in terms of working on the Hill, and I didn't realize how potent this group was in the States until we started seeing those bills. And then a whistleblower gave me the bills where the corporations, the corporate lobbyists were voting as equals with state legislators behind closed doors without the public present or the press present on many of those measures before they were introduced in the state houses. And so this is uh, the 10th anniversary of Alec Exposed, uh, of our launch of that this, this month. And um, as you know, Gordon, um, CMD just actually filed suit um, or filed um, complaints against Alec in the with it before the IRS and um, in the states about some of their activities. Uh, people can check that out at PR Watch. But I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about um, the the corporate role, uh, the role of the corporations in this agenda. So um, you know, the mo Alec is the most important vehicle through which corporate lobbying happens at the states. And uh, about one quarter of all state legislators in the country are members of ALEC. They pay like 50 bucks a year in dues. They meet four times a year in resorts around the country. And they sit in committees that are made up half of state legislators and half of corporate lobbyists. And they write bills together. Or often the corporate lobbyists just bring the language of the bills. And then this all has to be approved by a, an overall board of directors, which is made up of corporations. Then these bills get introduced in cookie cutter fashion in legislatures around the country. And then the same corporations that write the bills fund these candidates' campaigns, fund you know, so-called think tanks at the state level to, to produce uh, you know, talking heads, experts on, on uh, media and white papers in support of their policies. And the same corporations also fund, you know, since Citizens United spend their own money directly on political advertising. So it's a very well-funded, well-coordinated 50-state campaign. And part of the reason I think it works and couldn't work in the US Congress is almost nobody pays attention to state legislatures. Mm -hmm. less, less than a quarter of Americans can name who their state representative is. And I understand it's just boring to most people, but that means that um, the corporations can get away with much more. And that combined with the fact that in most states, there's no filibuster. So it's much easier if you have a majority to just push through whatever your agenda is. So at a time when the federal government has mostly been deadlocked and most people are paying attention to Washington, the corporations have been changing all kinds of things state by state, moving this 50 state agenda through the legislatures. Yeah, I'm so glad I'm, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Gordon, because um, it really is this sort of seamless, uh, in some ways seamless process where these uh, state legislators cut their teeth on um, this idea that corporations should get an equal voice and vote to them. Equal voice and vote is Alec's language and it's promo to corporations. Um, Alec has tried to do some sort of uh, uh, shape shifting for some reporters claiming, oh, well, that corporate board is just an advisory board. Uh, well, they're, you know, they are the ones who are the primary funders of Alec. They, along with some right wing corporate, right wing um, foundations are the primary funders of Alec. And so they play a role and their corporate corporate lobbyists are voting on those bills uh, mm -hmm. in those Alec task forces. And so, um, and then as you point out, the um, these, uh, these same corporations have PACs that then um, fund these candidates, you know, sort of max out on their um, on those races, and those races aren't that expensive, and certainly not that expensive for corporations uh, to play a role. And then some of these members end up in Congress, like Debbie Lesko of Arizona uh, and others. Um, in fact, you know, um, uh, Joe Manchin was part of Alec uh, way back, and they've been taking credit for him a bit uh, in recent years. Um, but um, you know, I, I think that uh, when you mentioned the Citizen United decision and uh, how it has really unleashed this mass amount of dark money beyond what was already allowed in our flawed campaign uh, spending system. 
um, and we, you know, we see even more efforts to try to keep the public in the dark. I wonder what your thoughts are, just briefly, if you could share about the if the effect of Citizens United in this coming decade, um, or the and, and the Voting Rights Act uh, cases as well, um, if those things aren't repaired by Congress. Uh, well, you know, the impact of Citizens United was enormous. Um, we, Citizens United decision came down in January of 2010. And within two months, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is the, the biggest lobby in the United States, its budget is bigger than either the National Democratic or Republican Party. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce strategists from there got together with Karl Rove and created a, a, a new fund to tap into this suddenly unlimited corporate money in order to try to flip state legislatures so they would be entirely Republican. And there were 11 states that, that for the first time became entirely Republican, meaning both houses of the legislature and the governor's mansion in, that, in the fall of 2010, which was also the legislature that then did redistricting for the next decade, right? And, and there's more tight gerrymandering in state, uh, state legislative districts than there is even in Congress. So um, it had a, a huge impact. Um, and, uh, and it continues to have a huge impact. And you know, one of the things it does and is made even worse by the more recent Supreme Court decision is that is what you mentioned is dark money that it becomes impossible to trace where money is going. And there have been a, a, quite a number of corporations that quit Alec, um, I would say basically in fear of being boycotted. They quit after the murder of Trayvon Martin, they quit, or they quit around uh, climate change, um, and a couple of other things because, and who quit were companies like, you know, Coca-Cola or companies that were, could be boycotted by consumers. Already, even before the last decision, you could see that, you know, those same companies quit Alec, but remained members of the Chamber of Commerce and the Chamber of Commerce was a member of Alec. So you couldn't tell if all they really did was steer their money someplace. But what it did was take away from citizens the possibility of using a boycott or a threat of a boycott to have more democratic control over over state legislature and over political funding. Yeah, you know that the Coca Cola campaign. I remember um, uh, Mary Batari and I at CMD were working on the launch of Alec Exposed, and we launched with these um, postcards that uh, Sari Williams on our team prepped uh, with another colleague. Uh, that was like, "What is Coke? K O C H doing with Coke? C O K E." Uh, you know, in terms of the the attacks on uh, voting rights, uh, making it harder for Americans to vote, including students, um, climate change, the you know efforts to make it uh, almost impossible to mitigate climate change, and so much more. And then we were joined in that effort uh, by the tremendous leadership of Rashad Robinson uh, and his team at Color of Change and activists across the country who had been fighting to expose way back then in 2011, 2010, these measures to make it harder for Americans to vote. Um, and then uh, Rashad uh, and his team went to Coca-Cola and Pepsi and said, you know, you can't be selling these products to our community, their community, um, while at the same time making it harder for Americans to vote. And then, as you mentioned, uh, the awful tragedy of the murder of Trayvon Martin happened and, and we connected the dots between Alec um, and that measure in Florida, which Alec then took up and tried to make into a national uh, agenda uh, to make it easier to get away with murder. Um, and so, you know, there's been a lot of fighting to expose Alec, as you as you point out, more than 100 corporations have left Alec, including a couple of years ago, Exxon was one of the last big ones to leave. Um, but they're, you know, facing increasing pressure by consumers, uh, Americans who consume things, I should say. Um, and, uh, and I think that, you know, um, it, it, they have been stealth, uh, as you point out, in leaving Alec, but continuing to use Chamber or the American Beverage Institute in the case of Coca-Cola and Pepsi or other um, trade groups to basically continue to move that agenda forward, that right wing agenda. Um, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, Gordon, I, I'm sure you remember this, but one of the things that struck me um, when we were launching Alec Exposed was that um, that that first major piece of legislation to make it harder for Americans to vote to put past these onerous voter ID restrictions, it was actually voted on at an Alec meeting after Barack Obama was uh, won the presidency, and it was voted on at a meeting that was chaired by the National Rifle Association, and other corporations voted along with legislators to put push forward those measures to make it harder for Americans to vote. And so this this corporate agenda is so 
entwined, um, unfortunately, has been so devastating to our democracy, to having a an effective and functioning democracy where people get to have to vote and have their votes counted. I wonder if you could um, talk with us a bit, just to shift gears, about um, some of the trends you're seeing uh, coming up in this decade. And is there any positive news uh, or positive trends that you're seeing and people pushing back against this corporate agenda? So I think, you know, the, from from my point of view, the thing that is most hopeful is that on an issue by issue basis, the corporate agenda is very unpopular, from including both Republicans and Democrats. And where people have a chance to vote on specific issues, which is, I don't know, I think two thirds of the states about have um, uh, citizen ballot initiatives where you can vote on a specific law as opposed to um, just voting for state legislators, then we've seen things that have been passed by corporate controlled or ALEC controlled state legislatures get overturned by citizens. Even in, you know, I would say the reason that um, the anti-union law Act 10 stayed in Wisconsin and the, the similar thing in Ohio got overturned is that in Ohio, citizens could vote directly on that law. And in Wisconsin, you had to replace the governor. And of course, people vote for a governor for all kinds of reasons besides the issue that we want them to base their vote on. But we've seen, um, attempts to privatize schooling or force schooling into uh, force students into like for-profit um, online classes that were overturned by citizens in North and South Dakota and Idaho, like in, in deep red states. I would say even um, in, tw in 2016, I think it was Arizona, which voted for President Trump by a bigger margin voted to raise the minimum wage and create a right to a minimum number of paid sick days. And if you do the math, there had to be at least several hundred thousand people who both voted for Trump and voted to raise the minimum wage and, and create a right to paid sick leave, <clears throat> which fits with what polling shows. So there, you know, there are a number of examples like this uh, across the political spectrum where when people can organize around issues, then there's, there's strong support for a much more progressive economy. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, that's very heartening. Where people have the chance to to make their voice heard on those issues, they're voting in a progressive in a in a progressive way. Even if on the personality, um, in terms of some of these these votes, they're not uh, voting for candidates that necessarily uh, represent those uh, those more progressive views. Um, I wonder if you. I wonder if you could share with us a little bit more about what you've seen um, in terms of that education policy. Um, and higher education. I think it was Rupert Murdoch who said that um, uh, uh, that there's like a trillion dollar business basically that pe that these corporations want access to that is the um, provision of American uh, public education. And so we've seen this tremendous push through ALEC to privatize public schools, to redirect money from uh, from, uh, from from our tax dollars, from public schools to private efforts. Uh, in my state, uh, we hear um, these uh, for-profit companies advertising for students, using our tax dollars to advertise for students, uh, but public schools can't use tax dollars to advertise about, about their success. Um, public schools, you know, a lot of the, the teachers are providing uh, supplies out of their own pocket, as you know, and this attack on education has been so... Um, deeply driven by the right. People like Charles Koch, uh, people like Milton Friedman, Betsy DeVos, the, the DeVos family fortune, um, and more um, have really attacked public education. Um, and I wonder between primary and secondary education as well as higher education, um, what, you're, what you're seeing um, uh, as an educator, as a professor, what you see uh, in terms of these trends on either or both of these fronts. Um, well, if, if we have time, I would talk about each one separately. They're, they're related, but they're separate. And I can, I'll talk about higher education first as from the point of view of a professor. And then I've also been elected to the school board here in Eugene, Oregon. So I'll talk about K-12 after that. You know, the, the single biggest thing in higher education is cuts in funding. Um, and that leads in a direction and cuts in funding that were not like, oh, this is a tragedy, we wish we could fund it, but you know we're in a recession, we can't, but intentional cuts in funding for public higher education. So then that leads to bigger and bigger classes. ALEC, for instance, has a bill that they try to push in each state that would require the state to provide um, an online, a completely online education, four-year degree for $10,000 or less. Right mm -hmm. now, online education, as a lot of people experienced during the past year, 
is not the same quality as in-person education. And especially the kinds of things you get for $10,000 a year is not even what we had this past year. It's not like a professor teaching via Zoom, but a canned class that is that is mostly self-done, right? But if you cut higher education to the point where what everybody's doing is a, working 30 hours a week because tuition keeps going up and is not matched by financial aid, and B, in lecture classes with 200 other students, then the difference between that and doing an online class is not that great. So the, the push to privatize and to go online, which is a, a huge industry, is is helped by making the, the budget cuts. We also see things like, um, uh, you know, universities get more desperate. So they do things like create ideologically based centers like the Mercatus Center, all the centers uh, funded by the Koch brothers, also things like the Center for Reinventing Public Education at the University of Washington, funded by the Gates Foundation, which is located at the University of Washington to promote school privatization, but is not they're not subject to peer review. They're not real faculty members. Um, and then very industry-specific things, like University of Minnesota has the Carlson Endowed Chair in Travel and Tourism. We here at university have Nike paid for a major in sports marketing. So some of this means that, you know, what's getting killed in higher education is the traditional liberal arts, right? English, God forbid you're interested in classics or philosophy or religion or something like that. All of that's being killed in college is kind of being turned into professional job training. But it also means that where in the past there might have been an incentive for some of the corporate organizations to say, well, we need to fund the general state budget for higher education in order to get highly trained people. They now have more of like a surgical strike thing. No, we'll fund sports marketing. We'll fund travel management or, you know, for the, the pharmaceutical industry, like we'll fund this exact kind of science and guarantee they can't release the data if it shows bad results about our product. So we have kind of a privatization of even of public schooling, but also this tremendous narrowing of what what intellectual life is like. Wow. Well, let me let me pause there because I, I definitely want to come to the question of your right. experience in school board. But, you know, this this I, I would love to talk with you more after this, uh, Gordon, about um, this drive by these right wing CEOs to really shape shape college education to basically create workers for themselves. Um, we have a piece that uh, we're in the process of publishing over at True North uh, and with Bold Rethink that talks about some of the roots of this and it's just shocking. And I know there's been tremendous efforts by people like David Halperin reporting about the for-profit schools and how they've been so predatory, many of them, uh, and how Betsy DeVos helped left them off the hook. So we maybe we should come back on and have a conversation more about that later when you have time. But uh, tell me more about uh, what you're seeing in the public schools, if you don't mind. Yeah, so in, um, in K-12 education, the attack has been even harsher than it has been in higher education for a variety of reasons. Partly there's, you know, it brings together the anti-union people because teachers unions in most states are by far the biggest union. So they want to do away with the union. Um, Anti-tax people, it brings together part of the religious right, which for decades has wanted to privatize schooling or, or turn everything into vouchers so that they could get uh, vouchers for private religious schools. Um, and, and, you know, this education actually, K-12 in particular, is one of the issues that really cuts across party lines and where you see how the corporate interests really trump partisan interests. And corporation, you know, Alec is not just like a cheerleader for the Republican Party. The, the biggest money, you, know, you, you mentioned Rupert Murdoch, and there are other people like this who basically look at K-12 education the way Wall Street looks at Social Security, right? They say there is three quarters of a trillion dollars moving through the economy every year in government guaranteed money and we don't have a piece of it, or we don't have a big enough piece of it. Mm -hmm. The biggest way that they make money off of that is through the replacement of human teaching with education technology. Mm -hmm. And that means that who's benefiting from that is Wall Street, you know, investment banks, venture capital, private equity, and the technology industry. And those are mostly traditionally democratic money, which I think is why, like, when you look at a lot of issues line up, you know, let's say minimum wage, right? More or less, if the Republican legislators have been on the side of cutting or, or repressing it, and Democrats have been on the side of increasing it. A lot of things line up like that, except education, because the money to be made is made by corporate sectors that are Democratic donors. And we see a combination of things happening. The promotion of privatization through charter schools or vouchers. And I think that, you know, this is one of the reasons why um, the attack on critical race theory 
-hmm. is happening now is, is for multiple reasons, but one of them is to push the agenda of vouchers, to push more parents to feel like I should have control over what goes into my kid's head. And the way to do that is give me my share of the tax money and I'll spend it wherever I want at a private school or homeschooling. So um, there's, there's privatization, there's a tremendous push to, to increase the use of education technology. And together with that is like a dumbing down of what it means to teach and to learn. Mm -hmm. So you see in states, I think this included in Wisconsin, where they lowered the criteria for what it takes to be a certified teacher and said, oh, you can have life experience or you can just have a, a BA in the subject area. You know, which, and I could say, I've seen things sometimes that Alec people will say, like, how crazy is this? Here's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, and he's not allowed to teach middle school science, right? So I have a PhD in political science. If you ask me to teach the Constitution to 12 year olds, I have no idea how to do that because teaching is its own thing, right? But yeah. increasingly, they want to dumb down teaching. So it's really like content delivery. And this, again, is very unpopular. Even if you ask Republican voters, should teacher certification standards be lowered or raised? Everybody thinks they should be higher. They should have to you know, spend more time under a mentor before they go into it. But so we see things like that, privatization um, and the move to technology that, that together is a push ultimately to, to do away with public schooling as an institution, I think. Wow. So I can talk more about this, but I'll, I'll shut up here. No, that was terrific, uh, Gordon. I, we really should do a follow-on that really delves into that. I mean, your knowledge of that and analysis is so astute. Um, I'm going to shift gears, though, before we come into the final portion of the Dialogue for Democracy today um, and um, ask you a little bit about um, what's happening in Texas. But before I do that, I just want to mention that this um, coming month is the anniversary of the, of the Powell memo, which was this memo written by Lewis Powell for the Chamber of Commerce, uh, which you mentioned, um, who then went on the US Supreme Court and he wrote this uh, document about how corporations should be playing a, a greater role in creating um, these groups and influencing education at the, at the uh, university level as well as at the uh, public school, uh, primary, secondary level. And a number of groups were, create, were created in response to that memo, including the Heritage Foundation, which um, was, is now at the forefront of these efforts to make it harder uh, for Americans to vote, to push forward these really restrictive voter measures uh, based on debunked claims about uh, uh, widespread voter fraud or any type of voter fraud that would affect the outcome of the elections. And so I just can't be on Zoom with an expert on state legislatures and not ask you about your opinion of what's happening in Texas right now um, and and uh, and this, the, the terrible voter suppression bills that are trying to be passed as well as other harmful uh, policies uh, that restrict civil rights. Um, and we're seeing, you know, we, we've seen these uh, courageous uh, Texas uh, legislators fight back. Democrats had left the state to uh, avoid this special session. Um, and obviously the, the march moves forward with the right-wing ALEC legislators in the state. Um, I wonder if you could tell us your take on Texas and also if you're seeing uh, anything there and other places where people are successfully pushing back on that agenda. Well, sure, there are places where people are successfully pushing back. I think, I mean, obviously, I, I think the bills being pushed are, are terrible and I hope the Democrats succeed in, in thwarting them. <clears throat> but I think Texas is a, is a microcosm of something bigger. Um, and so just to put it in context, right, if you think from the point of view of the corporate lobbies, their big political strategic problem is that their agenda is unpopular, right? And so what do you do about that? For several decades, the strategy was, you know, they aligned with the social right and they've, and everybody ran on um, anti-marriage equality, anti-abortion and anti-immigrant stuff. And around the, just after Obama's election, the GOP did this internal uh, post-mortem of the election and came to the conclusion that they couldn't win national elections running on those issues anymore because immigrants were becoming a bigger, bigger part of the population. And because everybody below age 35 or something was becoming more and more both in support of choice and in support of marriage equality. So the, the kind of corporate wing of the GOP said, we need to be, we need to drop these social issues and become kind of a kinder, gentler GOP. And their attempt in a way, I mean, if you look at the Tea Party, the Tea Party was a lot of different things for different people, but for the corporate funders who created it, the Tea Party was an attempt to create a base 
that would rally only around like anti-tax, anti-government and corporate issues. If you look at, they created their, um, they called it the contract from America, I think that, that uh, members of Congress had to sign on to, to get the Tea Party endorsement. There's nothing there about abortion, nothing about uh, religion. They, it was their attempt to get away from that and it failed, right? And part of that is if you look at demographic trends, the demographic trends in the country generally are moving towards a more liberal position. There's more immigrants, more urbanization. The younger people are, are more liberal. So you can see just like demographic trends is stacking up against the right. And so their response, right, they, okay, the kinder, gentler response didn't work. The Tea Party response didn't work. And then Trump comes along and says, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what the postmortem said. And I'm going to double down on the social issues on the on the um, gamble that we can whip up so much frenzy among the base that they'll turn out in greater numbers and that and that together with increasing voter suppression will let us win elections. Mm -hmm. So it's a and I think this is you know what we see in Texas is obviously the heavy voter suppression and then we see bills um, against abortion against critical race theory which is like a and non, there's no K-12 system that teaches critical race theory. It's a legal, it's a law school thing. Uh, they passed a law requiring professional sports to play the national anthem at every game as if this was a big problem that had to be solved, right? Interestingly, they did not pass a law that was anti-immigrant, which I think is because they're worried about the immigrant vote in Texas. So their focus on these kind of social issues that are very um, like red meat issues in order to get the people elected who will carry out the corporate agenda. And they need voter suppression as part of that. Mm. But, you know, it's hard to know. I, I, I never try to predict things. It's hard to know where this is going to end. It could end in like a huge shift to the left. Like if, if Democrats finally take over and they undo the redistricting and they undo the gerrymandering and they undo the voter suppression and all of a sudden that demographic trend is going to get expressed in a huge way. Or it's also a very dangerous strategy because the only place for them to go is to continue whipping up like ever more frenzied um, emotion around whatever it is, you know, anti-gay, anti-immigrant, anti-black, anti-something. And, you know, that puts us obviously in a more and more dangerous situation as a society. Yeah. Wow. Those were such keen observations, Gordon. I mean, um, those trends and how they've come together um, and what we're, you know, looking at in terms of 2022 or 2024, in terms of that intensity of a minority of, of voters uh, who then try to capitalize on these voter suppression measures in the aftermath of one of the biggest turnouts in US history in terms of the election in the middle of a pandemic and with so many young voters voting and voting absentee uh, to see this sort of repression. My, my hope personally is that people respond uh, strongly to this effort to make it harder for people to vote by being determined, more determined to vote and bring more and more friends out to vote. But before we get to the um, the rapid fire questions, um, is there anything that you're working on right now that you think people should know about or you want to uh, share with people? Um, yeah, one of the things I'm working on um, both, both as a professor and as a school board member is to try to do away with a lot of standardized testing. And this is something that really came to the fore during the COVID crisis because most states either canceled, I've canceled standardized testing in 2020 and largely avoided it in, in this past year. And um, that's part of a, a sentiment. Again, if you I think it's very, very popular among both Republicans and Democrats saying we want there to be less testing. We want our kids to spend less of the school year preparing for standardized tests. Um, but testing is a critical um, backbone of the education technology industry. Mm -hmm. If they don't have testing, like that's the way they market themselves. That's mm -hmm. the way they create a national market instead of each teacher or each district saying, oh, here's the book that we like, or here's a, here's a nice thing that we like to do as a way to, to teach math or teach English or something like that. Their drive is to create standardized products. So there's, I think right now, you know, when people are saying, what are the right lessons to take from COVID when we go back to school in September, there are some people saying, well, what we learned is that, you know, there are places that said we can't do regular teaching. So let's teach lessons about dirt and worms because every kid has dirt and worms around their house and be more creative and more engaging and forget about the standard curriculum. So mm -hmm. then you can say, oh, well, we, we saw that that was the right thing to do. Let's do it even when there's no COVID. 
What the corporate side is saying is what we should learn from COVID is that everybody needs high speed internet and we should have more online teaching and more education technology products and are pushing very hard to bring back standardized testing as, as fully as it was before COVID. So this also is a fight that not that many people are paying attention to, but could have a big impact on K-12 education. Wow. Well, let's definitely come back together uh, when you have time and talk about that some more because it's just, it's an, in, an area that I think so many people are interested in. I am a, I came through the public schools in Colorado and I am um, so grateful to have so many creative teachers and to have so many uh, electives that have been so restricted by these budget cuts and by this the sort of Trojan horse of no child left behind and this testing regime that both serves to try to, like you said, advance this corporate profit bottom line and also try to push for privatization of public schools. Um, it's just astonishing that we're seeing uh, this this move forward with such force in the aftermath of people's real lived experience uh, during the pandemic in terms of really um, the importance of creati creativity and education versus this testing drive. Anyway, um, let's get to the let's get to some of the quick fire questions and then I'll let you get back to your really important work this afternoon. Gordon, um, do you have a favorite constitutional amendment and if so, why or why not? Uh, I would say the first for freedom of association. Ah, wonderful. Uh, do you have a hero uh, or who is the hero who is uh, you have that has helped uh, do good in the world or set an example for you? I think about um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who was an organizer with the Wobblies who led the big bread and roses strike of textile workers in about 100 years ago, a famous big successful strike. My, my daughter is named after her, so that's my hero. Oh, oh, that's lovely. Um, is there a favorite book that you would suggest to viewers of uh, these Demo Dialogues for Democracy? You know, I feel like um, Naomi Klein's Shock Doctrine, which is might be 10 years old now, is still like if you were only going to read one book, is so eye-opening that that's the book I recommend. Yeah, so get Gordon's book and Shock Doctrine for your August reading on the <laughs> beach. It'll shock you. Both will shock you. Uh, do you have a, a favorite quote or motto, Gordon? You know, this isn't a motto. I saw this question and this is totally not political, but I like Stephen Wright, the comic. I remember his line of the, he bought powdered water and didn't know what to mix it with. So that's, that's my quote. <laughs> oh, you're a man after my own heart. I love Stephen Wright. I love that. That's wonderful. Um, okay, four more questions. Star Trek or Star Wars? Uh, Star Trek. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, Veep or Parks and Rec? Parks and Rec. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, nice. Uh, do you have a favorite Saturday Night Live political impersonation? You know, I would say Kate McKinnon as almost anybody who she's done, certainly as Hillary Clinton, but like uh, almost everything she's done has been great. My mom and I were just talking about her uh, last night. Like she, she can, she can do almost anyone. Amazing. Okay. Last question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, this is the question that was proposed by my dear friend, Jeannie Murray. Uh, uh, in Major League Baseball, she's a big fan. In Major League Baseball, players have a song they choose when they walk out to the bat. What would your walkout song be, Gordon? I would say uh, James Brown's I Feel Good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, next time you're on, I'm going to open with that song with you. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing uh, your part of your day with us. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And those who watch later, uh, this is Lisa Graves. I've been talking with Gordon Lafer, and this has been the Dialogues for Democracy for Bold Rethink. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank Gordon. Thank you.